This is the 2024 Jaguar I-Pace, a car I completely forgot existed. Is this an EV you should still consider? Let's find out. Launched in 2018, the Jaguar I-Pace had very few EV competitors, at least in Europe, where Tesla was still a novelty. With cars like Kia e-Niro, Nissan Leaf or Volkswagen e-Golf, nobody seriously thought about the upcoming electric revolution. Meanwhile, Jaguar unveiled a thoroughly modern model completely different from anything in the British brand's range, with parameters that five years later still look decent. And that's before we get to the driving experience. More about that later. First, the changes which are so discreet that a Volkswagen facelift seems like burning actual cash to heat a house. The pre-facelift model had a front panel which sort of kind of looked like a grill. Now there is a panel which no longer kind of sort of looks like a grill. I assume this is a step towards some future Jaguar design. In my opinion, before the facelift, the front looked more interesting, but probably there is some minor aerodynamic benefit to this as well. With the new front, there is no clearly visible pass-through to the air outlet on the bonnet. I did pour some water into it and it just dripped from underneath the car, so there is some connection. On the side, gone are the black panels on the doors. They are now body color, even if it's hard to see on this Portofino or navy blue car. In the rear, gone are the I-Pace and EV400 badges. Since there's no other I-Pace, there's no point informing people about the powertrain variant. It's a Jag and that's all you need to know. And to get a better idea of the car's dimensions, the Jaguar I-Pace falls between the Volvo XC40 Recharge and the Tesla Model Y. The Jaguar has the longest wheelbase and is the widest, but the Tesla has a larger boot and is longer and taller. The tailgate is electrically operated, there is no gesture control on this test car. According to the manufacturer's data, the boot capacity is up to 656 liters, but if you search deeper, you will end up with a figure of 505 liters, which is more in line with reality, and that's taking into account a small storage compartment under the floor. There are shopping bag hooks, a 12-volt outlet, and an elastic strap to secure smaller items. There are also anchor points on the floor. The parcel shelf does not fit under the floor. There is also a frunk or a fruit with 27 liters capacity, just the right size for charging cables. Uh, I don't know why, oh, geez, this is heavy. BMW or Volkswagen, for example, don't take into account the realities of using an EV. Not every AC charging port is equipped with a charging cable, so it's better to carry your own just in case. And since it sometimes rains or snows, sooner or later the cable will be wet and dirty, so putting it in the boot or behind the seats, especially when you have light upholstery like here, isn't as convenient as using an EV should be, according to car makers. The rear seat. In my 2018 review, I said that I expected more space in the back and perhaps a light colored upholstery would visually enlarge the interior, well, I got the light upholstery now and it does indeed make the interior look more airy. However, there is less space than one would expect in a car with a nearly 3 meter wheelbase, 10 centimeters longer than in the Tesla Model Y. The space is just okay. I'm 175 centimeters tall and the driver's seat is set to my driving position. Compared to the Tesla, I prefer Jag's regular four-zone climate control, where the rear passengers can actually adjust temperature or seat heating themselves, rather than having to ask the driver to do it. There are two USB ports, but Jaguar didn't bother to upgrade them to USB-C. There is also a 12-volt outlet. The door pockets are rather narrow, but there is an armrest with cup holders. The pre-facelift model also had some storage in the rear armrest and now that's gone. However, the backrest now splits 40-20-40. Doors cover the sills. In the front, I looked hard and as far as I can tell, the only difference is in the cup holders. They can still be removed to partially uh, expose the 10-liter 
storage compartment under the armrest, but now there is no longer a phone cradle between them. Otherwise, just get in there. <laughs> Everything else looks identical. There are large door pockets. Above the knee, there are buttons for opening front and rear boots and the parking brake switch. The instrument cluster is identical to the pre-facelift model, and so is the steering wheel with buttons and scroll wheel. The scroll wheel is still too light to use, so when I have to press it to select, I often select an option higher or lower in the menu, or I exit the menu because I touch the return button next to the scroll wheel. In the middle of the cockpit, there are two displays for the PV Pro infotainment system. The top one is mainly multimedia, and the bottom one is for climate control. I'm sure there were several software updates since my review in 2018, but the displays look identical and I can't tell if anything changed in the interface. In a Tesla, a single software update can sometimes make the interface noticeably different, with all advantages and disadvantages of that. The iPace also now has wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. This is a result of one of the over-the-air updates. Apparently, so is raising the onboard AC charger power from 7 to 11 kilowatts. If I were to complain about something, the top display could be at a different angle, as right now it reflects a lot of light from the outside. For example, in the Range Rover Velar or Evoque, the angle of the display was adjustable. It was, because now there are new larger fixed displays. Below the main display is a second screen with physical temperature controls, heating and seat ventilation. Even lower is a wireless charger and on the passenger side there is a USB port. More USB ports are in the storage compartment under the armrest, including one USB-C. The glove box is on the small side. The Jaguar I-Pace has a 90 kWh traction battery. The Tesla Model Y Long Range or Volvo XC40 Recharge have batteries of about 80 kWh. 90 kWh batteries tend to be installed in larger EVs. Jaguar doesn't say what the energy consumption should be and only provides a range of up to 470 km. Simple calculation shows that to achieve this, the iPace would have to consume about 18, 19 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. Maybe in city traffic and eco mode, this is achievable, but the combined cycle figure I got was 24 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, giving me a range of 370, 380 kilometers. And that's more or less how much the onboard computer displays with a fully charged battery. And this is how much I drove before having to recharge. Speaking of charging, 100 kilowatts DC charging may have been impressive five years ago, but today smaller and cheaper cars can peak at higher rates. Having said that, the iPace's charging curve, published by the Dutch Fastnet Charging Network, shows that the car charges steadily at over 80 kilowatts, up to about 70% state of charge. I've seen worse curves. Acceleration. Jaguar promises 0 to 100 km per hour in 4.8 seconds, but I have not been able to verify this result. Let me explain. Even in the pre-facelift iPace, there were times when my phone's GPS went wonky. I suspect it's the electromagnetic field in this model. This time, I wasn't able to get a strong GPS signal on my timing device. And I know what a Faraday cage is, but I have an external antenna for such instances. In this case, the timing device would only get a strong signal several meters away from the car. So, the only vaguely accurate measurement I got was below 5 seconds in normal mode, but even then it showed some incline anomalies on a flat straight road where I usually do my speed runs. Regardless, the Jaguar I-Pace can accelerate up to 200 km per hour, but no matter how fast it is going, it doesn't feel like you're going fast. The car has excellent soundproofing and is very stable. If it weren't for the range plummeting at high speed and relatively slow DC charging, I would gladly take the iPace on a longer road trip. 
But any Tesla can go fast in a straight line. It's the twisty stuff that unsettles EVs. Not only do I not feel more than 2,200 kilograms the I-Pace weighs, but I don't feel significant roll either. The steering gives great feedback, almost as if it were hydraulically assisted. And you can feel the rear motor working when you accelerate out of a corner. The I-Pace rides and handles brilliantly. I had completely forgotten about this. And for the past couple of years, I've cited Porsche Taycan as an example of the best handling electric car. Yes, the Taycan is excellent as a sporty EV, but compared to the I-Pace, it costs a fortune and it's not as comfortable in daily use. Meanwhile, the I-Pace is the perfect combination of sporty handling and everyday comfort. This test example has a regular spring suspension and passive damping. And remembering the pre-facelift model with active air suspension, I don't see a reason to pay extra for the air suspension. Unless, of course, 14 centimeters ground clearance is not enough for you and you need to increase it by two and a half or in an emergency situation, even by five centimeters to go off-road. And if you are planning to take your I-Pace off-road, here's my diagonal approach test. The I-Pace has a slippery surface mode, but I didn't use it as the surface wasn't slippery. The first attempt is in normal mode and the car gets going again without a problem. The second attempt is in sport mode with ESP off. You can only turn ESP off in sport mode. As you can see, there is much more wheel spin, so better leave the car in normal mode or in an emergency situation, use the slippery surface mode. Of course, a lot will depend on the tires. The Jaguar I-Pace prices start at 92,400 euro, about 12 grand more than five years ago. This test example is the R-Dynamic HSE with options, so modest, there is not even a 360 camera, and it costs 104,000 euro. It's great I revisited the Jaguar I-Pace. If you're looking to spend about 100 grand on an EV, it deserves a test drive. It might not charge as quickly as some of its more modern competitors, but on short and medium distances, it is much better to drive. And what EVs are on your radar? Let me know in the comment section below. If you like my sarcastic, down-to-earth and possibly mildly amusing car reviews, join me every Friday at 3 p.m. Central European time and don't forget to subscribe and like this video as it helps me with the YouTube algorithm. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.